Um, here's the thing, Michael. It, it is a busy time. You've got a stable mm. of about, what, I think 15 or 16 players. Yeah, yeah around that number. Um, how many of them will be moving? Good question. At the moment, we've completed about six deals and we've probably got another couple more to do to see if we can do before the end of the the close of the window um but things can be sprung upon you late someone can move a club can then decide that they want your player the terms are better than what they're already on so markets can get destabilized very 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 quickly that being said you always have your your no i try to position myself as early as possible in the window speak to the clubs find out where their position are on my athletes find out what my my athletes position is in terms of the market and then you make a plan from there but the final 30 days are just absolute yeah. crazy yeah, athletes 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 i like to call them athletes because they're football players of what they touch a ball no more than Two and a half, three minutes on a pitch? What are they doing the rest of the time? <laughs> Running. So the yeah. reality of it is, is we like to Well, as luck would have it, yeah. you're with two athletes this morning. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Cook and my, and my good self. Yeah. But I mean, it's a busy time for you guys, isn't yeah, yeah. it? Uh, yeah. Do you focus on this time, Michael, from way back? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the year? Yeah, I mean, I would say and argue that conversations can start from as early as february march time in terms of just clubs positioning to figure out where the market's at who's available what's it's what's it going to cost um then after all, once the window i'd say normally june july time you find that clubs are chasing target number one target number two target number three and then if those can't materialize because of like you've seen with the conor gallagher situation where west ham might not pay the fee that chelsea want for him then all of a sudden they've got to go back to the drawing board and see who else is, is out there and available um and then it just yeah it just perpetuates into this this absolute fiasco and chaos chaotic moment for 30 days where it's like right be by your phone and consistently be picking up and speaking to clubs technical directors scouts because just situations evolve so quickly Where's the real power now when it comes to a transfer? Is the power with the with the club? That's is the power question. with the agent? Is the power with the player? Who's the kingmaker <sighs> in any deal? There's no one situation where you can sit there and say that. It, I think it's always an evolving situation. So for a player, for example, with a year left, you know, clubs like to keep, you've seen Chelsea doing it recently, by the way, their transfer business. Players are signing up for seven years. Ultimately, what you're doing, and there's, I don't think there's release clauses in any of those contracts that have been mentioned or done. So the reality of it is Chelsea have complete and utter and complete control over your career at that point. Um, players like Kylian Mbappe with 12 months left, then the pendulum swings back into his favour. And there's this consistent power shift between clubs and players trying to figure out who's actually in control. Ultimately speaking, it's just dependent on where the deal is at, how the club value the player, how the player sees himself and what that market is doing. So there's no one set person who can control uh, the outcome of a transfer, in my humble opinion. It's all gone mad though, hasn't it? And it's gone mad because Saudi Arabia are in town. Right, okay. <laughs> I mean, these days, Michael, are you not, some of your clients, sorry, athletes, not, not, not saying to you, Michael, here's the deal, forget all that, mm -hmm. I'm not going to a championship club, get me out to Al Etifat. No, I've had I've had uh, a few calls for on behalf of some of our clients, athletes um, who have uh, who have had <laughs> Qatar proposed to them, uh, Saudi really? proposed to them. Yeah, I and mean, okay. look for us. It's, it's for me. It's age dependent. I think a lot of my my athletes want to stay focused on building their legacy, having their career, and that conversation they feel will still be there when they're thirty, thirty one, thirty two, towards the back end. So it's definitely a conversation they're prepared to have but they want to have their career first. Now, I think you'll find 90 to 95% of the market will probably feel that way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, fair. in some ways, it must have become the perfect contract tool for you. Why? When, when contract talks, come, in terms of negotiation. What, using Saudi, is that right. Saudi money to... Right. Mm, the reality of it is clubs know whether a player wants to go to Saudi or not. They, they know, and you've got it. There's an element of, right, okay, I get the industry is very Machiavellian by way of it's the culture, but there can be honesty amongst thieves and I'm not going to sit in front of a club and tell them, oh my, you need to bump up his money because we've got a, a, a mega payday from Saudi. They, they will look at you and go, right, if your player wants to go to Saudi, bring the money because clubs equally are getting paid from Saudi as well. So they'll probably look at it and go, go on, bring us the overinflated transfer fee. It doesn't materialise. 
there's no reneg of contract. So mm. you've mm. got to be realistic, dependent on which player it is and how you know lucid their their market is. But yeah, I'm not. It's not a. It's for me. I'm not using it as a tool to wangle out more money out of clubs. Not I, my style. I understand, uh, Alex. You'll have noticed that I certainly did. One of Michael's clients, Arno Dan Juma, uh, recently just joined. Uh, <laughs> Behave yourself. <laughs> Everton on loan from uh, Villarreal. Um, Everton, how does this work? Like for everybody listening, I mean, I de- transferred deadline day for years on Sky, mm-hmm. and I'm speaking to owners and I'm speaking to you guys. Yeah, uh, working your tails off to be quite fair. fair. Um, but how does it work? How has Dan Juma ended up at Everton? What now, or are you talking about the January debacle? Well, let's, let's see now. Now, um, I would say it was left with. <sighs> Look, the situation wasn't a great situation how it ended, but we kept conversations very much so afloat, knowing fully well that he would probably need another loan if it didn't materialize, if he didn't get the game time that we thought he might get at Spurs. Sure. What um, happened in January? Just to so, refresh our memories. <laughs> you sure you want to hear it? Yeah. Um, he was supposed to go to Everton. Um, they were leading the conversation right up until the point manager got sacked. And then out of nowhere, 11th hour, 59th minute, Tottenham called and usurped everything. And we made a snapshot decision to change course in terms of the direction as to where he went for that period, for that six months. Do you regret so, that? You know, oh, the lack of minutes can I, at Spurs. Can, can I be, no, do you know what? Put that aside because you make a decision and you understand that, you know, Spurs were fourth, they were offering, offering Champions League football. We knew his game time would be reduced. But it's not the minutes. Actually, I'll tell you, the one, Everton Football Club is a fantastic football club. It's easy for me to say because Dan Juma's there, right? Yes. But I'm, I'm being, honestly, the people behind the scenes. Oh, it's a great club. No, uh, special mention, Kevin Thelwell, the sporting director, Dan Purdy. Uh, there's a player liaison care officer there called Amy. Mate, they're just honestly nice, nice, nice human beings. And when we did it, when we decided to mm. make the switch, there was something within me that just didn't sit right with the fact that you knew you were letting down people that, that, that are team. actually yeah good good honest good it's, it's a tough industry to work in and i can honestly just look them in the eyes and go you're great people i'd love to have a relationship with you for the rest of you know for as long as i'm in, in this game so that was probably the toughest thing for me as an agent yeah um but yeah you know as a football club it's the thing is with everton it's got it's got the institutional feel of a Newcastle United or a, a, a Man has. United or a yeah, Chelsea absolutely. but the fan base is just they're brilliant ecstatic, is he comfortable with the reception he'll get from Evertonians oh mate he's 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 a he's a he's a nutcase then Juma he <laughs> so he was sitting he, he was playing against Everton on the bench uh, warming up in the in the corner goal went in 86th minute I think it was Michael Keane scores and he had 40,000 he called me up after he said Mike it felt like 40,000 people were screaming in my ear hurling abuse at him and he was like I love it this is really? a club. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's he loved it. it yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. he's actually looking back. Second time lucky, as he's been saying. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.